Hi, this is Lori Johnson with Hancock Whitney Bank, and you're listening to Local Leaders, the podcast. Visit localleadersthepodcast.com for previous episodes or for information on appearing on the show. Let's get into it, folks. Give you the rain breakdown, what we're looking at, what we're expecting, and when the relief will come. Rounds of rain and showers and thunderstorms, the possibility of an additional five to eight inches of rain throughout Coming the Coming into work Friday morning, thinking you're going to have a normal day. And then not leaving until sometime the next week. That was something I, I wasn't imagining. I don't think we all understood how serious it was going to be. He really did not have a clear picture of how detrimental things were outside. It was just like one hard thunderstorm after another that just never stopped. People's houses were flooding. They were losing everything. Hey, everyone, and welcome back to another edition of Local Leaders, the podcast. And honestly, I feel like no introduction is even necessary for this guy sitting across from me. If you're from these parts, you probably already recognize him. Uh, But I do want to welcome him for his first appearance on Local Leaders, the podcast. He is the congressman for Louisiana's 6th District, and he is Garrett Graves. So first, welcome, sir, to Local Leaders. Hey, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to join you today. Well, I am excited to have you on, and I've been doing research on you, and I'm like, I may know him better than he knows him. I don't know. We're going to find (laughs) out. Um, And interesting, you know, we probably need to start out with telling people what parishes you cover. I know it's about 800,000 people, roughly. Uh, it is, yeah, just just under. So, so we represent. It's it's a dozen parishes, and it's from north of Baton Rouge, so uh, towns like Zachary and Baker yeah. uh, up in central. But it comes all the way through uh, east and west Baton Rouge. It comes down to Iberville, uh, Livingston, Ascension. It goes down the river, just just kind of follows the river. So, Ascension, Assumption, St. Charles, Lafouche, Terrebonne, St. Mary Parish. So it just. Just wow. all the way down. So you got, uh, you know, you got east and west um, from, from, you know, up at the top at east and west Baton Rouge, Niberville, all the way down, and uh, and then ending down in Patterson and St. Mary Parish. Wow. That's a lot to keep up with. <laughs> it, it, it is. But it's, you know, I got to tell you, it is it is such a great part of the state. It, 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 really it is. is. Some of the, you know, of course, Baton Rouge and, is awesome, and, and, and Livingston Parish, you know, the east and west side is so different, but, yeah. but really cool. And then you get down in the Bayou regions, I mean, just a whole other group of people. Uh, so really enjoy the opportunity to represent the area. Absolutely. And uh, let's start kind of at the beginning of your uh, your career in the in Congress. And it's March of 2014. You announced that you're uh, going to run for the 6th Congressional District. I believe at the time your, the incumbent was Bill Cassidy and he was moving to the Senate. That's right. Um, so I was uh, working for the state of Louisiana. I had I'd got appointed to uh, rebuild the levees after Hurricane Katrina, restore the coastal wetlands yeah. about three years, uh, two and a half years after the hurricane. So I was doing that. And look, born and, and raised in the capital region. I had done work in in all of the river parishes, you know, that we represent, St. John and St. Charles, uh, Assumption for years. And I knew everyone down in the Bayou region as well, just from work that I had done on the coastal issues, on the levees. And so uh, had people come up to me like, look, Cassidy's going to run for Senate. You ought to run for a seat. I mean, nobody has that connectivity from the capital region, the river region, the Bayou region like you do. And, and I just, I didn't have any interest at all. I mean, yeah. it was, it was the, and it, I didn't even think about it for a second. The best analogy is I said, if somebody came up to you and said, you should be an embalmer, you know, <laughs> and you're just like, you know what? I, I, yeah. ah, thanks for that. you know what I mean? Like, but I just, I didn't even entertain it. And for nine months I had just different groups of people that came up and wow. urged me to do it. And, uh, and I never said anything to my wife about it just cause I'd never seriously thought about it. But one night she and I were out and a group of people came to us and started making the pitch again. And I'm like, look, you know, thanks guys, but, but not interested. And uh, next morning we wake up and she, t- she turns over and she says, you know what? You need to run. My wife who had a teacher for decades, hates politics, hates, yes. hates, hates, hates politics. And I just looked at her and I'm like, okay, who are you? <laughs> what are you doing in the bed? And, and she just said, she goes, you know what? Hear me out. She said, you know, I was listening to what they said and I thought about it. She said, you know the issues in this region, you know the people in the region, and you know how to get things done. And yeah. she said, you know what? I, I just, I don't like politics, but I think you're the person to do it. And that was the first time that I ever let myself think about it and took about two or three months and ultimately uh, jumped in and it was surreal. 
I can only imagine. And you end up winning that race uh, uh, in a runoff against another Louisiana political individual people may have heard of named Edwin Edwards. Yes. How was that? Uh, it was surreal. I mean, yeah. look, he, he was governor when we were kids, right? Yes. And so he was a myth or a legend then. Yes. And, and so, you know, at one point, I think we had up to 17 people in the race. I mean, there were just, you know, everybody and their brother were in. So huge, huge uh, group of people. But then we got to the runoff with, with Edwin Edwards and I, and um, I got so just scared. Uh, I remember we, we came up to the debate. We were going to have a debate, and we had it right at Forest Grove he, here in Denham. And, um, and I sat out in the parking lot. Yeah. And I was afraid to go in because I just, my, my nerves, I was so scared. I mean, this, again, myth or legend when we were kids. And it's like, it's just going to be the two of us. And um, finally, the campaign manager's like, um, all right, it started three minutes ago. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> no one else is going to debate him than you. So you got to, <laughs> right. but, but it was, it was surreal and ended up, uh, ended up winning. Yeah. Yeah. Really uh, in, in winning, you know, 62 and, and some change uh, percent. So definitely a vast majority uh, fast forward to today, your fifth consecutive term in Congress. Yeah, wow. yeah. It it, it um, it's it's certainly flown by. Uh, yeah. Never thought never thought I'd um, I'd do this for for this period of time. But you know, it's one of those things. I think when you um, when you feel like you can contribute more, when you feel like you still got some some oomph left and, and be able to get some things done, uh, looking at seniority and does it make sense to stay or does it make sense to let somebody else come in? But look at this point in January of next year, if we play our cards right, January 2025, I could be chair of the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. Yeah. Full jurisdiction over roads, bridges, traffic, ports, waterways, transit, airports, Corps of Engineers, which of course is Comet Project and Flood Control, Hurricane Protection, Coastal Restoration, full jurisdiction over FEMA disasters. You know, I mean, so you look at that and you're like, gosh, I, I feel like leaving would be a disservice to the people that we represent because our ability to, to force change and reform in, in organizations like the Corps of Engineers and FEMA alone, I think could just be life-changing in a community like this. A friend that we share named McHugh David, this is a story involving him, so I hope you don't get mad that I'm sharing it, and he shouldn't. But me and McHugh were sitting around talking one day, and this was several years ago, and we're talking about term limits. And I was kind of one of them people, I was always back and forth. I'm like, yeah, we need them. No, we don't. Yeah, we need them. And, uh, and he said, Jim, I'm going to tell you, you know, my thought on that. And he said, if you have term limit limits, you'll lose like a Garrett Graves just based off of term limits. And I said, you're right. Screw term limits. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want term limits no more. Yeah. Because, you know, and we're going to get into the impact that not only you've had on the Livingston Parish community, but on me personally tested, not even a good enough word to describe what happened a year and a half after you were in office, of course, we're talking about 2016, right? Yeah, it was, um, I mean, that was certainly some baptism by fire. Um, we had somewhere around 60 to 70% of the people that we represented uh, were dealing with probably the worst flood event, uh, worst disaster they'd ever experienced. And driving through miles and miles of communities watching and, and seeing um, everything people owned, uh, family heirlooms, scrapbooks, picture albums, just out there on the curb destroyed. Um, and, yeah. and all the people, you could see it in their face. I mean, just 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 completely deflated. Um, that was a really, really challenging time uh, for, for this community. It really was. And, and for those that may still not be familiar and, or, you know, I do have listeners in other areas. It was seven trillion gallons of water, 31 inches of rain in just a couple of days fell. As a matter of fact, we're, we're recording right now, completely underwater. Um, I want to spend a little time on this because I feel it's an important aspect of not only who you are, but your leadership ability. And that's I want to share this quick personal story. And uh, like so many others, I flooded, you know, with a, a million other people, it seemed like. At the time, my girls were 11, twin girls. My son was 13. And when the rain stopped, we had lost every single thing we owned, including our vehicles. Uh, with the exception of the clothes we had on, we had nothing, not even food. Uh, and we were just one of thousands. My father-in-law was bedridden. 
uh, had Alzheimer's. He was eventually airlifted off of Highway 16 in South Range about three days after uh, after we were out there um, in the middle of the road with thousands of other people. Now I'm 41 at this time, Congressman, uh, the man of the house, right? I never even showed a hint of stress to my family or anybody around me, but inside I felt it. And when the dust settled and we got to gutting our home, we were blessed enough to purchase a camper from someone my wife knew. I remember it like it was yesterday. I walked into that camper, hard day, hot, you're gutting, and this comes on the TV, this, this commercial spot from you. And if you'll allow me, I'd like to just read what you said in it because I, it had a, a major effect on me. And uh, the title of that commercial spot was Unbroken, and it said, Historic flooding shook our spirit, devastated our homes, our businesses, and put tears in our eyes. But it also brought us closer together. Neighbors helping neighbors, like the Cajun Navy, our law enforcement, firefighters, teachers, our churches, and countless others, many with flooded homes themselves, but working around the clock to help entire communities banding together because in Louisiana, there are no strangers when one of us is in need. We're proving every day that our resilience and passion will be the key to our recovery. I'm Congressman Graves. I know that you're tired and worried, but I've seen your determination and hard work and know that standing shoulder to shoulder, we will rebuild. We're telling our story to our nation's uh, leaders in Washington, and every day working to get the resources needed to recover. No stone will be left unturned to fix the problems and make sure this never happens again. We will recover because our spirit is unbroken. That's what I needed to hear right then at that time, because it was tough, as you know, as you saw. And um, and then I saw you in front of Congress, and uh, it was a oversight committee meeting with FEMA officials on their lack of response early on. And you had the mayors, uh, Gerard Landry was there, and uh, the mayor Walker, the mayor Central. And you stood up, and for seven minutes, you, what we would say in the South, kind of told them about themselves. <laughs> and it was uh, amazing. And so we're going to insert that clip real quick. Uh, I think everybody needs to hear this because uh, Congressman Graves, I think it's important for people to remember um, how tough that was on all of us and, and who was there for us. Chairman, uh, I want to thank you for hosting this hearing. Uh, Congresswoman Duckworth, you as well. Thank you, Chairman Chaffetz. I, um, I appreciate you all bringing attention to, to this issue. Um, uh, look, you all are aware of the statistics. Uh, last time I talked to FEMA, uh, this, this flood event has received one half of the national media attention that, that the South Carolina floods received. And it, while it's never a good idea, I think, to compare disasters because there's such personal tragedy in them, um, it, it is amazing that there has been such a lack of, of urgency and knowledge and understanding of what's happened. This is a 1,000-year flood event. A 1,000 year flood event. Uh, this is something, and I'm going to rip a line from Mayor Shelton. Um, this, this event could happen in any city. And I understand that the folks say, you know what, it's not in my state. I don't care. It's not affecting my constituents. It does. Because what happens here, the precedent allowing lackadaisical attitudes, allowing lack of priority, has a profound effect. On, on what happens to our constituents, but when you have a disaster, whether it's an earthquake, an avalanche, a volcano, a flood, a hurricane, no matter what it is, a terrorist attack, it's going to have a profound effect because if you let things slide, if you let folks take a lackadaisical approach here, it's going to be the same thing in, uh, in your state. You know what? I've, I've tried to communicate with other members of Congress and compare this disaster. Uh, Chairman Chaffetz has just talked about the fact that it was 31 inches of rain and comparing it to, to other places. The national American rainfall, the average rainfall for this country is less than that, and we got it in 36 hours. Put that in perspective. Seven trillion gallons of water. Seven trillion. The reality is this. The Stafford Act is entirely insufficient to respond to this disaster. It is entirely insufficient. You can play tens of thousands of times over where people in South Louisiana are upside down in their mortgage, their jobs are underwater, literally. They, they, their cars have flooded out. They've lost their clothes. They have nothing. And we have got to 
increase the urgency of the response here. You know, th this has been an amazing community watching what's happened in South Louisiana. Everybody at home talks about the, the Cajun Navy. We didn't sit around and wait for people to come rescue us. We got together and rescued our own people. We did it. People trashing their boats, putting them li their lives on the line and their safety at risk to go rescue one another. We had the Cajun shelter set up where people opened up their homes, businesses, churches, and everything to shelter people. Cajun chefs popped out, pulling their barbecue grills out, cooking for tens of thousands of people. And the Cajun Army got together. And the Cajun Army did an amazing job going through and stripping and gutting tens of thousands of homes in South Louisiana. Let me be clear. This wasn't because anybody directed them to do it. It wasn't because they were paid to do it. They did it because that's what our community is about. But now we're in this position where the volunteerism, the generosity, the, the selflessness, it can't get us any further. Now we're to the point to where we actually need help. The housing unit progress is absolutely unacceptable. The fact that NOAA can come out in two weeks and say that this is attributable to climate change, fascinating to me. I couldn't even imagine that scientific calculation. This is attributable to climate change, but they can't tell John Doe on whether he's going to get a house or not, whether he's going to have a place to live, still living in their moldy home, still living in a tent, still living in a car. It is amazing what can happen when you prioritize things. You have a political agenda, you can make something happen. And talking about urgency again, in two weeks, Noah can come out and do complex calculations to determine this is a result of climate change. Yet, in 30 years, the United States Army Corps of Engineers can't deliver the Comey Diversion Project that was authorized by this Congress in 1986. I don't know how many times we're going to continue the stupidity of spending billions of dollars after a storm instead of millions before making our communities more resilient. It is absolutely absurd, and this has a profound impact on the individual lives of, of, of many, many folks in South Louisiana. The parish that two of these mayors here represent, Livingston Parish. Initial estimates are that 86% of the homes and 91% of the businesses were flooded. Think about that for just a minute. 86% of the homes and 91% of the businesses. It has devastated communities. It has absolutely devastated them. It's crippled them. Mr. Robinson, I, I appreciate you being here, and, and we've worked together for a long time. Um, and, and again, I really do appreciate you being here. This is projected to be the fourth most costly flood event in United States history. I'm really scratching my head as to why Mr. Fugate is not here today. I, I don't understand that. I, I don't understand why he is not here. Um, this is a huge event. Stafford Act, as I said before, we're blowing the sideboards off of Stafford Act. The White House needs to send an emergency supplemental request, including the, the, the unmet needs package of CDBG and other things to help address this, to help us recover. We need to have a more robust flood protection projects funded like COMET, AMET, uh, uh, parish flood control projects and others to help lower the base flood elevation in this region. These things need to happen and need to happen right now. Um, uh, I'm going to yield back. I just want to, Mr. Chairman, very quickly note that we're joined by a number of folks that have been down there in the trenches through this disaster in addition to the esteemed panel of the Governor and the mayors. We have our lieutenant governor, uh, Billy Nungesser. We have our commissioner of agriculture, Mike Strain, uh, state senator chairman of the uh, Homeland Security Committee, uh, Bodie White, um, a number of other uh, leaders from the from the state of Louisiana and, um, and and folks that have been in the trenches and tireless in their efforts to help recover and uh, looking forward to working with, with my friend Congressman Richmond over there on a, on a full recovery package. Thank you. You'll back. Eight years. I've been waiting to tell you thank you for doing that. I've told Mayor Gerard Landry a hundred times and he laughs every time. And, and, uh, but thank you because not only to me, but to so many people, we would not have made it not had it not been for you. This town would not have survived. That's just the sheer facts of it. Oh, uh, look, uh, I, I appreciate it. Uh, one, that's my job, right? That's, yeah. that's my job. That's what I'm supposed to do too. Um, I want to, I want to put a little bit of perspective for folks that maybe aren't from here and, and, and help, Folks understand the background under which all that happened. You remember just weeks before the 2016 flood, we actually had the police shoot. Yes. Where we had officers. Of course, the shooting was in Baton Rouge. We had officers who were from Denham. Yes. Uh, from this community that, uh, that that didn't make it. And, and that event ripped the community apart and then started bringing people together. But you could tell. I mean, folks were really on edge, and it was a really weird time. Then we had the 2016 flood. And 
the Cajun Navy, you know, sort of existed from Katrina, as you recall, but mm. Cajun Navy on steroids was created in the 2016 flood. This was not a hurricane. It was not an announced storm. You didn't have CNN and Fox and everybody else with the little logos going about hurricane, whatever, storm, whatever. This thing was just boom. It was an afternoon. It was a night. And as you indicated, the, the extraordinary volume of water, but also by some measure, this was a 1,000 year storm. Yeah. And, and so you had people whose homes were flooded that were still out there in boats collecting others and rescuing and everything else. It was it was awesome to watch people come together. Now, when you have a hurricane or other events that are getting the national news or on the front page of the paper, it's easier to get assistance from Washington. In this event, no one knew this had happened. No one. And so we're sitting here trying to advocate and educate in Congress. And everybody's like, what storm? What are you talking about? And so we finally got a plane. We flew members of Congress down here. We said, we are going to make you see this. And we brought them down here. And, and that is where the game changer was, because people were with us flying over miles and miles, driving through miles and miles, and they went back and they were like, no, 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 this is serious stuff. And so then our, our advocates grew, and we were able to start getting assistance and start getting recovery dollars and everything else. But um, uh, uh, let me say it again. The community is what was amazing, the way that people came together, the way that, as I said in the, in the commercial, in the video, um, which, which, by the way, we were out gutting a home. Video crew came over and said, hey, we want to cut a commercial. And I'm like, man, I've got, you know, <laughs> wood yeah. in my hair and she I'm, 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 I'm soaking wet and whatever. And he's like, you know what? Let's just do it. And so we just kind of just did it. Um, but, uh, but look, the community is what was awesome. It, yeah. you, you, can, you can secure dollars. You can get programs. You can get federal agencies. But if you don't have the community like that, it, it's not going to work. And the community was absolutely amazing. Complete strangers going in, as you know, mucking and gutting other people's homes. It was just, it was phenomenal. And these people would sit there just completely looking helpless and hopeless. And then this group of folks would come walking up and I mean, just lifting spirits and awesome uh, watching the community. It really was. And, and, and I'll just leave that thought with this. Um, but there's a long story to it, but three days later, we managed to get out and get, we hit, we hit the interstate and didn't stop till slide L, you know, and, and, uh, I remember us trying to get down Jubin, a lady stopped me and she said, you can't go down Jubin in that, now, you know, I was in a, a truck that was actually her father-in-law's, my wife's, uh, father. And I said, uh, I, I got to get out of here. I got three kids and people were getting hungry. Yeah. It was hot. Um, and she said, you, you're taking a risk. It's still flooded really bad. Well, I went down Jubin. I got behind an 18 wheeler and that 18 wheeler made a wake just enough to where I could see the road. Because when I got on Jubin, it was licking up almost on the windows of the truck. Oh my God. There were swamped cars with, I'll never forget, passing a woman and a baby on top of a car. And, you know, us as men, we want to stop and help. But if I stop, my whole family swamped. Uh, so I kept going. My wife starts crying. And I, I thought she was crying because she was scared. I turned and I said, I got this. You know, I always driving, you know, four foot of water. And she kind of hits me and she says, not you. Look at that. And it was people launching boats. And my wife said, that's our people and it moved her to tears yeah. and me as well and it was something that if you weren't there and you didn't see it you'll never fully grasp it yeah. um but you were for me and so many others in that uh in that event the voice of louisiana and someone that i could rely on for information because you couldn't hardly get it uh and, and I will always be thankful for you and, and forever in your debt for what you've done. And I know you say that's your job, but it could have been the wrong person at the wrong time. And I, I'm thankful every day it was you. So thank you for all of that. Okay. Um, proactivity versus reactivity. Uh, seems like it can be a problem sometimes in Washington, um, especially with this flood. One of the things that you pushed uh, as far as getting funding, not only for this flood, but disasters is, in general is, hey, let's be proactive and not reactive. Let's not wait till something happens to figure out how we're going to pay for it. N number one, being a good financial steward of the United States Treasury, you can look at all sorts of reports, calculations, estimates. Being proactive is, is an extraordinary cost saver, extraordinary cost saver. 
Um, you're going to spend millions before or you're going to spend billions after. Yeah. Just a quick ballpark estimate. 2016 flood, just sort of in this region alone, we ended up appropriating somewhere around $20 billion all in. Yeah. And, and you wow. know, just kind of putting things in perspective. You had a project north of us, the, the Comet Diversion Project. That project um, was, was uh, sort of originated in the early 1980s. When I came to Congress, it, it had been stalled. Thing had moved. I, I will make note that before the 2016 and flood, in January of 2015, the very first, first month I started, we secured, I think it was $7 million off a project that had been completely stalled. Then a few months later, we got an additional $10 million. Um, and so we started getting that thing going again, even before the flood. And then after the flood, you know, that's when we brought them down and said, guys, no more piecemeal. We're going to do this thing. And, and so... We, we came in and we fully funded the Comet project. We fully funded this other project called Five Bayous. We, um, we got money for Livingston Parish to come in and do clearing, snagging, dredging, removal of debris and vegetation in about four to 500 miles of rivers, bayous, canals, and ditches to help get flood water, evacuate flood water faster. In fact, they've done wow. it. They've done it twice now. They've Sorry. done almost uh, over 900 miles of this stuff because they've done the four to 500 twice. Um, That's huge. It, it, it is. It is. And most people don't realize that this entire basin, everywhere from St. Francisville on the east side of the river, from St. Francisville down, it all drains into Lake Maripal. Yep. It doesn't drain into the Mississippi River. And so we now, with the, with the Comate Diversion Project, that is a billion-dollar project, that project is going to connect to the Mississippi River, pulling water off the Comate. We, uh, we funded a new project. Um, in the French settlement Port Vincent area called the Highway 22 Spillway. So right there off Highway 22, there's going to be sort of a southwest, a new outlet off the river, draining into the Maripaw Swamp higher. So you'll have Diversion Canal, Blind River, and third this, this third Very one. And so, so a lot of stuff going on now to, to, to really be proactive, to, to, to not get us back to where we were in 2016, but to truly bring us next level. Now, the bad thing is that we don't need to go build projects from the 80s and say we're done, like the Comey right. project. So we, we've brought, you know, the good news is we brought some new projects to the table and secured an additional $1.2 billion on top of the other billions for old projects. The 1.2 is exclusively for sort of those next level projects, the perspective, the proactive projects, yeah. like the Highway 22 spillway. So we're really excited about all the progress that's been made, but we got to get these projects finished. Yeah, I, I agree. And and you've really done a good job with the projects that you brought, uh, not only to the, you know, Louisiana as a whole, but Livingston Parish, uh, the broadband, the, uh, yeah. the broadband for all, if you will, where uh, we had underserved aspects of our community that, you know, COVID hit and they couldn't get on uh, broadband if they wanted to to go yeah. to school with these kids. Yeah. There just wasn't access. It, it's amazing. And that, that Red Oak community was one of the first ones that reached out to us when we when we started in 2015, came yeah. to us and started talking to us about it. And so we started looking around. And I, I don't remember the exact number, but I think we ended up finding it was either upper 20s or, or maybe even high 30s on the number of different broadband programs that are out there. They had ones for schools, libraries, banks, healthcare. Um, wow. They had ones for rural areas. Uh, that, I mean, it was just, it, it was it was unbelievable, the number of programs. And so, you know, we're sitting here looking at this and said, who is coordinating all of this? Who's making sure that the that the bank is not putting one on top, a, a, a fiber line on top of the one that the school is doing? You know, yeah, I, who's right. looking? There was no map. There was no map. There was no coordination. There was no nothing. Wow. So one of the first things we did is we pulled in all of the different entities, again, from the healthcare providers to the banks, to the schools, to the libraries, uh, to the communications companies. And we started doing meetings in the parish and said, look, if there's not a map, if there's not a coordinated plan, let's sit down and make one. And uh, to John Bell uh, Edwards' credit, he appointed later a sort of a broadband czar who came in and started mapping the whole state. But but ultimately, we did the right thing. We got money to the communities that uh, didn't have the right types of connections or, or didn't have any connection, had to use satellite, yeah. and um, and been able to make some really good progress. There. Yeah, I agree. And uh, this parish in particular was was well underserved in a lot of areas and we did get some money for that um i also wanted to mention let's talk about rotc one of my favorite programs y'all uh, uh in existence probably i think our young people are where we need to put a lot of investment and it's hard not to learn structure from rotc um 
we did not have a program at Denham Springs High School. Our neighbors in Walker did. Buddy Mincy, who was the school board president at that time, had applied to get the ROTC program. He was denied and he knew exactly who to call to see if he could get some resolution. Tell me about that. Yeah, um, that was uh, that was a really cool experience because, you know, we, we talked a little while ago about this community. You talked about how your wife teared up yeah. um, because of all the community members just volunteering and going out there and doing rescues and everything. Um, that's our community. And so when when Buddy Mincy initially reached out to the to the Army and said, hey, we want to we want a ROTC program here, a ROTC, uh, a junior ROTC program here, uh, they said, look, yeah, we're, we're, we're not doing expansions right now. We're not going to do any more. It's not going to make sense. We're not going to have enough students. I mean, every reason to say no. So, so we reached out and started talking to them, and they were giving us the same line. We're not going to do expansion. Um, you know, there's just not the appetite for these types of programs anymore. And, um, and we said, look, I hear you. You don't know our community. You, yeah. you don't know our community. And they just they, they said no at every turn. And we kept going back and just saying, you know what? I just want you to trust us. Just we know our community better than you do. I want you to trust us. And I don't remember the exact number, but but I believe when when we finally convinced them to do it, I think that they told us that it was the highest number of applications for any first year junior ROTC program in the country. Like it was just they were dumbfounded. And yeah. we were like, look, this is us. Like we, we, we bleed red, white, and blue. We love our country and, um, and, and love our service members. And, and they were blown away. And I mean, they were just like, you were right. This is amazing. And, yeah. and so Buddy knew what he was doing. Um, the, the Denham Springs High School is a fantastic school and just a great community. And, and it's awesome how patriotic that, yeah. that school in this community is. It really is. Very, very proud. My son uh, and daughters participated in ROTC. Uh, and it wasn't even in my urging. I didn't have to urge them. <laughs> they wow. just did it That's awesome. um, and learned a lot. Let's talk about fentanyl real quick. And you've got some help coming for East Baton Rouge Parish Sheriff's Office in that fight. Fentanyl is killing a lot of people. Yeah, Same it's way. actually for Sheriff Art as well. It's going to be yeah. a capital region program. Very but, good. Um, but, but look, so, so um, after the 2016 flood, uh, you, you, know, you don't think about all these things. But we started seeing suicides go up. Uh, we started seeing mental health problems happening. And the thing that really got me is we started having kids put in foster care. And, you know, Sheriff Hard and others can tell you, I mean, the number just spiked. And yeah. at first I'm like, what, you know, what, what is going on? This is crazy. And, and we got, to every, got everybody together, you know, the law enforcement and got the, uh, the child and family services folks and just uh, everybody together and started sitting down trying to talk through and understand what was happening. And, and they said, look. This is an effect of the flood, um, that all these people, you know, the stress, the, the despair uh, ended up turning to drugs. Fentanyl became so readily available. And, and so then they couldn't keep the kids because they were addicted and they were um, uh, high or passed out or whatever all the time. And, and so we had a foster care crisis in, in Livingston Parish. And so we started working on that. And then, you know, you, you start talking to the experts, the law enforcement and others, and you realize the source of it. Yeah. And, and of course, this open southern border, which is crazy, is, is just allowing for these massive volumes of fentanyl to come across. And, um, you know, as, as somebody said the other day, one pill will kill. And um, mm -hmm. it is such a small amount. So, so we've gotten together with, um, with Sheriff Gotro in East Baton Rouge, um, with um, uh, Sheriff Weber in, in Ascension Parish and Sheriff Ard here in, in Livingston and uh, doing a, a fentanyl and a violent crime program where they are going to be focusing on, because a lot of the a lot of the, the violent crime is tied back to the drugs and they're going to be focusing on uh, millions of dollars and they're going to be putting together technology they're going to be working on a, a, a specific group of folks that are really going to be focusing on this issue trying to stop this fentanyl crisis trying to stop the supplies from getting in getting people help that are addicted and and really trying to turn turn the corner on this awful, awful epidemic we're seeing. Yeah, it really is awful. And I'm glad I'm glad to see our congressman out there uh, not only recognizing that, but taking some steps in order to do what we can do to rectify it. The Graves Carter fix. Let's talk about that real quick. I find that very interesting. That is a, a bill for the benefits. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. For the d disaster victims. A lot of people had some issues with those DOBs, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, look, you just you 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 get so frustrated. Um, you've got 
all these federal agencies and, you know, they've got their Washington, D.C. based rigid rules and programs. And so one of the things, you know, every, all, we're, all everybody's trying to do, everybody who, is, who has their head above water, they're trying to help. Yeah. And so in, in the community. So you have all these agencies come in and people are like, look, I don't even know where to start. Everything I own is flooded and gone. My, my cars, my clothes, my house sounds very similar to what you experienced. And so like, look, I, I, I don't want a handout, but I need a hand up right now. And so you have a, a loan program through the Small Business Administration that loans to individuals, not just businesses, to, to families that are in need. You have FEMA that does a grant program. And, and then ultimately, as part of all the work that we did, in addition to the billions and billions we've got for uh, flood control and some of the reactive and proactive projects there, we also got $1.7 billion in grant funding for people like you that, that yeah. flooded and need to rebuild your home. And so um, here's the catch. Uh, I'll give you the scenario. You and I, let's say that we live across the street from one another. Our homes are identical. We got the same uh, uh, height of water in the house. It, it, it did the exact same dollars in damage. We make the same amount of money. We have the same kids, everything identical. And let's say that you were proactive and you said, gosh, I've got to get back in my community. And so you took that loan from the Small Business Administration and you started swinging a hammer and you went down to, you know, Home Steins, uh, Home Depot, whatever. And you You're got telling all, my story, uh, right? This is exactly and, how and, it happened. And, and you got everything you needed. And, and again, you mucked and gutted and you started rebuilding your house. Yeah. Um, and, and so that's what you did. Me, I'm across the street from you. And I said, you know what? I'm going to kick back at the, you know, Holiday Inn or whatever, wherever famous providing a hotel room for me. And I'm just going to kick back and stay here because, uh, I get free breakfast every morning. <laughs> they come in and they clean my room and, and change my sheets and give me new towels. And I'm just going to kick back. I'm not, I, I don't see the urgency that you see. Yeah. And so I sit in the hotel room. Well, over months, you can imagine, I'm costing the federal government tens of thousands of dollars. Um, in some cases, it can go into six figures. You Boom, you stayed with a friend in Slidell, you're back, you know, again, swinging hammers and you're, you're in your home. Well, then it took us one month after the 2016 flood to start getting the grant funding, the 1.7 yes. billion. It took the state months and months to get the program rolling. So let's say that six months later, the grants become available. I wake up one morning and say, eh, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll apply for the grant now. So I go and apply for the grant, I get the grant, okay? So I have a grant a grant, a Don't free money. Don't have to pay that back. You have a loan that you have to pay back. Yeah. I just cost taxpayers, and again, I'm going to make numbers up. I'm, I cost back taxpayers $100,000 in a hotel room. Um, I cost uh, taxpayers, you know, all the, the, the uh, staff time and everything else. All you did was apply for a loan and you started swinging hammer yourself. So uh, I, I'm a major liability to taxpayers because I got the grant and I got the, the free hotel room. You effectively are nothing, for no liability to taxpayers. You then say, oh, the grants bill. I'm going to go apply for a grant. The federal policy was, is that if you got a loan, you could not get a grant because they said that was double recovery. Now, obviously that doesn't pass the common sense test. <laughs> You're the one that should be rewarded for what you did. I should yeah. be penalized for what I did in my hypothetical scenario. I want to be clear, hypothetical scenario. <laughs> um Yet, under this policy, you were the one that was penalized yeah. for getting back in your community faster, for helping reestablish property values and taxes and uh, uh, an economy that can recover. Um, and, and, and so I said, this is crazy. So we started working initially with the Obama administration, trying to get them to reverse the policy that didn't pass the common sense test, couldn't get them to do it. Trump administration comes in, couldn't get them to do it. So we finally changed the law. So we changed the law. And I'm thinking, this is awesome. We're, I'm all excited. It took them one year, one year to write the rules. The bureaucrats didn't want to do it. So they finally write the rules. We start getting checks out to people. We finally got about 60% of the people that, that got assistance. And we find, so what do you mean 60%? Everybody needs it. We pushed them a little more, we got up to 80, maybe, maybe closer to 90% of the people, but they still, they, they came in and they invented this income threshold. And they said, anybody that makes over this much money, you are not getting anything, not a sliding scale. You're not getting anything. And the number, it depends on where you are in the community, but it wasn't a high number. I mean, it was like 60,000, yeah. I think in some combined income, um, in some, in some areas. And so we fought with them on that and we got a little bit more progress, but ultimately that last 10 to 20% of people, they've been stuck. Of the $1.7 billion we got, 
only $700 million of it was actually given to homeowners, the people that we intended all of it for. And here wow. we are, here we are approaching eight years later. It's unforgivable. Yeah. So, so I have put provisions in different bills through the House of Representatives over and over again to, to fix this. And every time it'd get in the Senate and it would get shot down. So we worked out this really good solution. We think we worked out everybody's concern, House, Senate, Republican, Democrat, worked it all out. And in this last negotiation, it got jettisoned on Friday, on Friday in negotiations with the Senate and the White House. And so I'm, I'm really aggravated about this because that last 10 to 20 percent of people, they deserve to be helped. And, and having only 700 million of $1.7 billion dollars Given to homeowners for assistance after eight years, it's not okay. Yeah. Uh, so we're still, I'm committed to fixing this though. Yeah. It's the story of many, uh, and it is outrageous. Let's talk about uh, crawfish farmers real quick. And look, they had a tough, tough year, y'all, last year. Droughts, record heat, uh, but you got some help for them. Yeah, yeah, we we have. Um, so, so look, um, uh, crawfish is a, is a difficult one because you, you go to somebody in Michigan or you go to somebody in mm. North Dakota or Iowa and said, Hey, look, we need help for crawfish. You're like what? <laughs> um, so, so the shrimpers were having problems. We we're able to do some things for them. Everybody likes shrimp and we we're able to get the USDA to buy a bunch of shrimp for food programs and stuff. Crawfish has been a little bit, bit more difficult. Um, so one, uh, the, the crawfish farmers have, have been challenged because of the drought, but also the wild crawfish uh, has been has been harmed as well because of the drought and the low water on the Atchafalaya River, for example. And so um, we, we have been working both with the United States Department of Agriculture to try and address some of the farm crawfish is usually harvested with rice. It's usually, uh, it, it, it's a complementary crop to rice. Yep. And so for those, we've been working with the USDA to get assistance there. And then for the wild ones, uh, it's a unique uh, species because you don't have a lot of fresh water commercially caught seafood. Right. And so um, uh, National Marine Fishery Service and NOAA, they do um, wild seafood assistance programs, disaster programs, but they don't do fresh water. So we had to get USDA involved for the, for the farmed crawfish. We have to get NOAA involved for the wild crawfish and trying to offer assistance to both of them so we can keep crawfish bowls going for, uh, for generations to come. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I know they appreciate it. I know I appreciate it. And everybody around here that eats crawfish appreciates well, it. We saw, we, all I know is uh, what, they were 12 and 15 bucks a pound for a little while. And all I know is, <laughs> <laughs> People are like, hurts. what? That hurts. Yeah, that hurts. <laughs> they're coming uh, down. They're coming down. I think, I, I think they're around, uh, uh, my wife said they were like seven bucks boiled the other day. Yeah. And, I, and it's weird when you think that's cheap, but I'm like, wow, that ain't bad. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, we do a little fun fact segment on our uh, on our episodes of Local Leaders. And it's just some little fun things that people uh, uh, get to know uh, your congressman, if you will. So I have three questions for you. Right. The first is, what did you want to be when you were 12 years old? Wow. When I was 12, um, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd say probably a police officer when I was yeah. 12. Yeah, um, me too. I, I just I always had, I still do, so much respect yeah. uh, for those folks. And just uh, even now, again, just, just hold them in such high regard for what they do and the sacrifice for them and their families. If you could have any superpower— what would you pick? I, I think fly. fly. Um, yeah, I just, me, I'm I, a flyer. I, I, yeah. I love I love being up and I, I spend a lot of time hiking and I like just getting up above things and looking down. I, I, I love it. Very good. And uh, what would you say has been your favorite part of being a U.S. congressman for the 6th District? For. Yeah. So hands down. So look, you probably run across people all the time that explain something to you like duplication of benefits or a veteran who is not being treated properly by the Veterans Affairs or the IRS has has improperly charged someone taxes. And you're looking at that and you just say, you know what, that's wrong. And, yeah. and you just you get frustrated and you get frustrated with the government. My favorite part is actually being able to help people. Yeah. And, and I, you know, and when, when people that. have those problems, when you see these crazy federal policies that don't pass the common sense test to come and say, you know what, we're going to do a bill and we're going to fix that. And I'll give you one quick example. I will never forget after 2016 flood, you can imagine all of these people calling and saying, Hey, I need help. I need help. And, and under a law that was written in 1974, we can help, but we need someone to sign a piece of paper, print out a piece of paper, explain, I'll sign it, and then send it to us in order for us to help them. It's a Privacy Act thing. 
And so you can imagine, I'm like, yeah, all you need to do is go to our website, click on this link, print out that form. And these people are like, hey, moron. <laughs> Remember when I told you my house was under eight feet of water? That would be my computer, my printer. You know, and you're just like, ah. He's like, how is it that I can order new T-shirts off of Amazon, but I can't help these people, you know, right. off of a phone or a or, or, or some type of mobile device? This doesn't make sense. And yeah. so, you know, it's a perfect example. Got together with a congressman from Massachusetts. We did a bipartisan bill, bicameral bill, signed into law. And today, you can use your phone. Um, you know, you can use your phone to, 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 to get assistance. If you have your, you lost your passport and you're overseas, how are you going to sign a piece of paper and send it over and all that stuff? So yeah. it's, it's awesome just being able to step in and say, you know what? We're going to fix that. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Well, you're doing a great job. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, please keep, keep fighting. I know you will, uh, will, but there's a lot of people out there that could not imagine uh, the sixth district without you. Quite well, frankly. All right, look, if, I, if you can give me just 30 seconds. Yeah. Uh, look, one thing, I really appreciate the opportunity to join you today. Um, it's no secret that in Washington, things are chaotic and it's a, it's a complete mess. Um, I, I just, I want to urge everybody who's, who's listening, no matter where you are, um, when, when, you're, when you're looking to determine who to vote for, just, just really look and see what these people have done. You know, we talked about a lot of things we've actually been able to accomplish by working together with a great group of people in this community. And, and, and the people that I think are often voted for are the people that are the loudest, that have the viral you know, video or whatever else, versus the people that are actually getting points on the board, people that are actually solving problems. And, and I'm really concerned about the direction of the country and the Congress right now. If we don't fix this and bring some more functionality back to the Congress, I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly concerned about where this country goes, the additional power, lack of checks and balances for the White House, for the judicial and others. And I think it's absolutely critical as we move forward that you think about your representative as a salesperson. You know, what are they selling? What are they what, what progress are they making? How are they advancing my company, our community, our family? Uh, really, really critical. 100 percent. Couldn't agree more. Thank you for coming on. You had a good time. Yeah, this was awesome. It Very was. good. It was. Very thank good. Uh, thank you to all you listeners out there. We're approaching one million downloads on YouTube. And look, we couldn't do it without each and every one of you. We are totally blessed to do what we do. And until next time, I'm Jim Chapman reminding you, love your community, support local business, and keep leading. Thank you very much. The epic floods in southern Louisiana expected to get worse today. Folks there are, are you know, they're struggling. Their homes are, are flooded. There's still a lot of water in that area. Historic flooding it shook our spirit, devastated our homes and businesses, and put tears in our eyes. But it also brought us together. Neighbors helping neighbors, like the Cajun Navy, our law enforcement, firefighters, teachers, our churches, and countless others. Many with flooded homes themselves, but working around the clock to help. Entire communities banding together. Because in Louisiana, there are no strangers when one of us is in need. We're proving every day that our resilience and passion will be the key to our recovery. I'm Congressman Garrett Graves. I know that you're tired and worried, but I've seen your determination and hard work and know that standing shoulder to shoulder, we will rebuild. We're telling our story to our nation's leaders in Washington and every day working to get the resources needed to recover. No stone will be left unturned to fix the problems and make sure this never happens again. We will recover because our spirit is unbroken.